Good morning. It's 8.30 on Friday, February 23rd. I'm Desiree Frazier. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, lawmakers in the state Senate want to fix the formula used to fund public K-12 through schools. Lawmakers in the House want to get rid of it altogether. Then Mississippi's 2nd District Congressman meets with students to discuss political engagement. And organizations representing teachers calling on the state's legislature to take action in filling job vacancies. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Lawmakers in the Mississippi House and Senate have competing visions for changing how the state's K-12 schools are funded. Since 2003, the Mississippi Adequate Education Program has been the formula used by lawmakers to fund each of the state's 145 public school districts. But many education administrators have reported frustrations because it's complicated and keeps them from determining future funding. Republicans in both the Mississippi House and Senate want to fix the formula, but they disagree on how to do that. Republican Representative Rob Roberson of Starkville chairs the Education Committee. He tells our Will Stribling, conservatives in his chamber want to start from scratch. The reason we think we need to make this move is that the, the current formula that we use is very complicated. Um, in all honesty, if I had, had to explain that to you right now, it would take 45 minutes and, and, and frankly... No formula that's funding education, something so important, should be that hard to figure out. Um, The new formula that we're we're trying to come up with, the base amount is $6,650. That's the starting point. Um, It has weights. If you are a new English learner, you get a weight for that. If you are a child with special needs, it's tiered. uh, And each tier goes up in level of like if, if you have dyslexia, for instance, uh, you could get a weight of 60%. If there is, say there's a little bit more involved with that child, it would be a weight of 100%. And if there's, uh, if there's a child, say, that has a lot of, of, of special needs, that could be uh, blindness, deafness, uh, maybe that they're, they're in a wheelchair, uh, that would be 170%. Um, there's a, a mechanism for gifted a child that, that maybe lives in a, an area that is very poor, by the time it's all said and done, you have these weights that help get districts, especially districts that are that are having trouble, hopefully we get them more money. Uh, the intent is to, to make certain we're focusing on the right things, make sure that, that school districts are focused on the right things. Uh, now, there's the flip side of that is, is that districts that uh, don't have that uh, they may not get as much. Um, and so the reality is is that, that those that can afford to pay more are going to be expected to pay more. Those that can't, we're going we're to step in and try to make certain that, that, that we're covering them. That is the intent. Uh, it's based on an individual child. So we're going to look at each individual child. We're going to have expectations that the school district is looking at each individual child. And, and, and that's what we say we want. Uh, the, the formula that we were using it really doesn't do that. There's a lot of administrative costs that are, are considered and things like that, but the reality is I think this is a better formula as a whole because it takes in what each child will need. Yeah, you mentioned administrative costs, and that's been a criticism uh, levied at, at districts with just really high administrative salaries. What, do, what, what is the intent of this legislation to do to, uh, in terms of reining that in? Well, one of the things that we're doing as far as this legislation, there is an element of this uh, that that has a committee that's going to be set up for consolidation purposes. Uh, we're going to be looking at districts that aren't big enough to, to, to handle that. Uh, hopefully, the as we move forward in the next few years, uh, districts that have fewer students that, than, than they need to be able to carry themselves, those districts will be consolidated. Uh, districts that are in the D and F uh, arena, uh, those districts are going to be looked at, and we're going to try to find solutions for them. I do not want this to be beating these districts over the head with a, with a hammer. This is hopefully you know, putting us in a position to where we're helping these districts find consolidations and, and ways to make it make sense to run a school. You can't run a school with 100 kids in it. You can't run a school with 10 kids in it. I mean, you're, you have to have some some basis of having enough kids to make this make sense. 
And there's, a, I know you have it reviewed the the Senate legislation, but uh, y- y'all are just in, are in fundamentally different places right now. Where one wants to revise the MVP, one wants to scrap it. How do y'all bridge that gap and get something done? Because you know it doesn't matter much if if each chamber just passes its bill and then nothing gets done. Right. Well, number one is that 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 the chairman on on the Senate side and and I've got to get with him and find out what they need and want and and we try to come together with something that makes sense. Uh, honestly, it may not happen this year. It may happen next year. Uh, I hope it happens this year, and I hope that we're going to just find a place that makes this work. Uh, I do know that, that they have a position that they want to stay within, and we have a position that we want to stay within. But, you know, nine times out of ten, you're, you're able to find some, some common ground. And I know beyond any doubt that, that, that the lieutenant governor and my speaker – uh, they all want to go in the same direction. We just want to make schools the best that they can be, make sure that we're protecting children the best that we can, and make certain that we're giving the teachers the support they need and the parents back home the support they need. That's House Education Committee Chair Rob Roberson, a Republican from Starkville. As you heard, the Senate is seeking to modify the existing MAEP formula as opposed to the House plan to rewrite a funding proposal. But the Senate is moving to increase spending using the MAP formula, which has only been fully funded twice in more than 25 years. Senate Education Chair, Republican Dennis DeBar of Leakesville, says he's hopeful the two chambers can work together to fully fund schools. Well, I, uh, I don't believe there'll be any issues on the Senate side. As you know, we passed it unanimously last year. Um, I expect that this year. I could be wrong. Um, wouldn't be the first time. But... Um, I think working with uh, Chairman Robertson on the House side, uh, we'll sit down and, and just hash out the differences if we can, and um, you know, hopefully we can come to a consensus and, and move forward. But I think um, the Senate's position, as, as determined last year and I think so far this year, is we, we are moving forward with the, the MAP formula with some technical changes that we've made, uh, fully funding it. Um, and that's where we're at, and then, and then, so stay tuned. Last year, lawmakers did not fully fund MAEP, but they did pass one-time allocations to help school budgets. Coming up, Mississippi's second district congressman meeting with students to discuss political engagement. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. For MPB's Moments in Black History, we highlight Denise LaSalle. After finding her voice in the church of her childhood home of Belzona, she switched to R&B music and in 1971 created a number one hit trapped by a thing called love. But it was not until she signed with Jackson-based Malico Records that she became known as the Queen of the Blues. In 2015, Denise LaSalle was even inducted into the R&B Music Hall of Fame. This has been MPB's Moments in Black History. No matter if you use an app to start your car or still have a flip phone, Everyday Tech can decipher today's technology for tomorrow's solutions. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or the MPB public media app. Hi, I'm Richard Gershon, the host of In Legal Terms and a professor at the University of Mississippi School of Law. If you miss a live In Legal Terms episode, find our podcast, inlegalterms.mpbonline.org. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. Second District Congressman Benny Thompson, a Democrat, is meeting with students across the state about the importance of civic engagement. At Jackson State, he's talking and taking questions and sitting with them in a circle to discuss issues such as voting and climate change. Thompson tells students they need to be encouraged and educated on how to navigate the political environment during a presidential election year. You know, when I was a student here, I didn't get a chance to talk to the congressperson that represented this area. I just happened to be a graduate of this institution also, so I'm glad to be home. I'm glad that our students are interested in what's going on in the country. Uh, The largest voting precinct in Hines County is on this campus. So it's an opportunity for students' voices to to be heard uh, by voting. But it's an opportunity for them to talk to me about what's going on, not just in Washington, but what's going on in the world. 
sophomore Khalila Kareem is a political science major from Columbus. She says having the congressmen sit with them helped put some of their classroom discussions into perspective. Often they talked about civic engagement, how we can go back and educate each other. When he was talking about civic engagement, voter registration, we it takes it takes a village. So we have to hone in our peers, hone in on the people around us to educate each other, just to make sure that the people up top, the legislators, are acting in our favor. So that's why that's my biggest takeaway from here. Following the meeting with students, Thompson spoke with reporters about what's going on in Washington. Among the issues, the cancellation of student debt for more than 150,000 Americans this week. Well, there's no question about it. Student debt is one of the main issues for young people, uh, as well as parents of young people who attend college. Pell Grants are absolutely essential. Uh, So what President Biden has done, uh, based on what the courts have allowed him to do, is to defer and actually make the debt go away. Uh, Some students I run into who finished school 10, 15, 20 years ago are still carrying debt. That's an unnecessary and unfortunate burden. So we support any debt cancellation. These students need to hear that. Uh, And they will determine whether or not those individuals who are in Washington uh, deserve their vote. So, Congressman, you chaired the January 6th committee. It looks as though former President Trump has all but officially locked up the Republican nomination. Could you just speak to the importance of civic engagement in a year like this with former President Trump seemingly back on the presidential ballot? Well, you know, in America, we sell our differences at the ballot box. Uh, It's just so unfortunate that the person on the Republican side has 91 criminal indictments uh, against him, uh, but he's leading the ticket. So I guess uh, the work of our committee obviously has generated those charges, but the fact that he's leading the ticket indicates that there's still work to be done. Uh, A lot of us plan to educate the public as to how close we came to losing our democracy uh, on January 6th and how we can't have people who admire Vladimir Putin uh, as a a dictator becoming the number one person uh, in this country. Uh, We have to have people who understand that democracy is precious and that you can't uh, cajole with dictators who rape, pillage, and kill uh, other people just because they don't like them. You just can't do that in a civilized society. So the greatness of this country is we pick our leaders at the ballot box. And so our job is to educate the public uh, as to what's at risk if they don't participate or if they end up voting for somebody because they didn't understand their record. On the other side, I know that you support President Biden and you are had communications with the president, and there's a lot of concern, even from Democrats, that, quite frankly, the, as the polls show, that a lot of people are concerned that President Biden is too old to be president again. What, what, what do you say to that? Well, I think with age comes maturity. Uh, but to be blunt, I'll take Joe Biden being 81 years of age than Donald Trump with 91 criminal charges. So you have no concerns about the president's mental acuity, the ability to serve for another four years? The Joe Biden I know is right on all the issues. He's right on uh, student debt uh, deferment. He's right on educational opportunities. He's right on Social Security. He's right on defense. Uh, He's doing what's in the best interest of this country. Now, there are some challenges with how that message is being delivered. And I think you'll see that being upgraded uh, as the campaign progresses. But I have absolutely no problem uh, with Joe Biden's age. Uh, I have a problem with Donald Trump's policies. That's Mississippi's second district congressman, Benny Thompson, a Democrat, speaking with reporters in Jackson. Coming up, organizations representing teachers calling on the legislature to take action in filling job vacancies in the state. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. 
From children's education to gripping drama, documentaries to comedy, MPB Television brings the world to Mississippi. With local stories, cooking, health, and music, MPB Television takes Mississippi to the world. The work week ends with local programs on MPB Think Radio. At 9, all aspects of gardening are discussed on the Gestalt Gardener. Next Stop Mississippi highlights events taking place around the state at 10. At 11, explore women's health on Southern Remedy for Women. For Moments in Black History, we salute former Representative Alice Clark, who was the first black woman elected to the Mississippi legislature. And now she's the first black person and first woman to have a portrait on display in the state capitol. Elected in 1985, Clark, currently an 84-year-old living in Jackson, served 39 years before deciding not to seek re-election in 2023. This has been an MPB moment in black history. This is MPB Think Radio, Mississippi Public Broadcasting. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. Many teaching jobs at public schools across Mississippi are vacant. That's according to a new report from the State Department of Education this week. Teacher vacancies declined between the years 2022 and 2023, but some of that progress was undone in the past year. Among the greatest needs for teachers is in the Delta. Our Mike McEwen speaks with Torn Ballard, K-12 policy analyst at Mississippi First, an education advocacy nonprofit. I think the biggest takeaway from this data is that the positive effects of the 2022 teacher pay raise are starting to really wear off. Due to inflation, the average teacher salary in Mississippi is now worth $2,000 less when the pay raise first went into effect in 2022. Now, this is critical because teachers consistently rank compensation as the most important factor in determining their career plans. So I would say that this increase in teacher vacancies is really just the predictable result of failing to improve teacher compensation as the cost of living continues to rise whether that's the cost of groceries or insurance premiums. And that number, as I said, it rose 7% statewide. It rose almost 40%, just under 40% in Mississippi's 2nd Congressional District, which comprises almost all, if not the entirety, of the Delta. Why do you think there's such a large, I guess, statistical gap between those two numbers? So you're absolutely right. It seems like school districts in the Delta appear to be having a much more difficult time recruiting, retaining teachers than other regions across the state. Now, to me, this underscores the fact that, you know, the severity of Mississippi's critical teacher shortage really does vary significantly by community. And so when we're looking at, you know, why Congressional District 2 or why the Delta specifically, I think there's going to be a lot of reasons when you look at a region that large Um, So I don't want to generalize too much, but we do anecdotally often hear that hiring in rural areas like the Delta is much more difficult because simply it's hard to convince folks to relocate to very rural areas. I'll also say that many communities in the second congressional district are a stone's throw away from Arkansas. Now, that's important because Arkansas recently boosted its minimum teacher salary from $36,000 to $50,000, a $14,000 jump. And because teacher pay in Mississippi just have not kept pace, there's this huge incentive to drive, you know, maybe half an hour over the border and immediately boost your take-home pay by thousands of dollars. And what are just generally some impacts of teacher shortages or vacancies, especially getting into these higher percentiles, What are the impacts on students themselves and instruction in schools? So we know that when districts have vacancies, they are more likely to have to rely on teachers who either don't have a lot of experience in the classroom or teachers who are not teaching in whatever subject they are licensed for. 
And while we don't know enough to say that this, there is causation here, we do generally see a correlation between student test scores and the percentage of teachers in a given district that are inexperienced and that are teaching in an area that they do not have a license in. Now, I want to be clear that there's plenty of really great young teachers and plenty of great teachers who, you know, are on a emergency license or have a different license in the subject they're teaching. But generally speaking, in districts that have a high percentage of inexperienced teachers and teachers who are on an emergency license or teaching in a different area, they tend to have worse test scores when we look at ELA and math. To your knowledge, what are some other challenges to teacher attrition, I guess, separate from financial considerations? When we surveyed teachers, it was very clear that in addition to compensation, which across the board is always the number one like biggest factor in determining career plans, we do know that teachers also care a lot about the quality of administration that they have. And they also care a lot about respect from families, respect from politicians, and respect from the general public. Now, we haven't asked enough questions on these surveys to specifically determine that, you know, some of the restrictions on what can be taught in classrooms, whether that's having a direct impact or not. But I can tell you that administration plays a huge role and also respect, whether that's from the general public or specifically from politicians, is also a really important factor when teachers are thinking about their career plans. So what are some policy governmental level solutions to teacher vacancies in the state, I guess, at a general level? And if, if there are any specific policy measures you think would be effective? So there's a lot of different things that, you know, individual communities can do on a local level to try to make their school district a more attractive destination for teachers to go to. That's going to vary by, you know, community by community. But generally speaking, when we look at Mississippi as a whole, the number one factor that we hear teachers talk about is compensation. We know we had a historic pay raise two years ago, but within those two years, all the states that we leapfrogged in terms of pay, they're starting to raise their teacher salaries too. Unfortunately, some of this data is released on a lag when it comes to teacher pay, but by my own count, it's only West Virginia and South Dakota that currently have a lower average teacher salary than Mississippi. So at the end of the day, no matter what district you're in across the state, Mississippi school districts are at a severe competitive disadvantage when it comes to compensation, whether you're looking at the actual salary itself or whether you're looking at things like the state health plan where some teachers are paying over $10,000 a year in premiums. So at the end of the day, you have this huge competitive disadvantage when it comes to compensation, and that is going to make both looking at private sector jobs and even teaching jobs in other states a much more attractive option for Mississippi teachers. Torn Ballard is the K-12 policy analyst at Mississippi First. Stick around for a full morning of Mississippi program. You have been listening to Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. And join us tonight at 630 for this week's episode of our weekly legislative recap show at issue. This week, host Michael Gidry sits down with the House Speaker, Jason White, to discuss how his chamber is considering changes to Medicaid and other topics. Remember, you can find past installments of this and other Think Radio shows online at mpbonline.org. I'm Desiree Frazier. Join us Monday morning at 8.30 for the next Mississippi edition, only on MPB Think Radio. Have a great weekend.